Hello, dear friends. Some words of Torah for Parshat Shemini. Our sages praise Aharon for being silent after Moshe offered him words of consolation after the deaths of his two sons. The Torah states, Vaidom Aharon. Aharon was silent. Rashi tells us that Aharon's silence was an act of valor, and he was rewarded for his silence and that Hashem spoke to him afterwards directly, without the intermediation of Moshe. But is silence truly the best that we could expect from Aharon after his two children perished? Did we not see this past week a father of two daughters not be silent when his daughters Maya and Rina were murdered and later his wife Lucy succumbed to her injuries? Was Rabbi Leo D. silent? He held a press conference shortly before the Chag resumed to sanctify God and the Jewish people, to elevate our stature among the nations, and to call upon the world to reject moral equivalence. And he said, we will never accept terror as legitimate. We will never blame the murder on the victims. There is no such thing as moral equivalence between terrorist and victim. We all know the difference between good and evil, and it's time for us to differentiate properly. He declared that April 10th would be International D's Day, on which the world could reflect on the difference between right and wrong. And he called on all good people to post a picture of themselves with an Israeli flag to demonstrate that. We watched Rabbi D speak with great courage, and we were in awe of his strength. Truly, this man was able to put aside his personal suffering for the greater good, to call upon the world to do better. If so, could we not expect Aharon to do the same? Why, when Moshe expressed to him how Nadav and Avihu's deaths were a sanctification, why didn't Aharon call a press conference for all of Klal Yisrael and express to them this sentiment? I was bothered by this question until I saw a Hasidic story that is brought in a number of Sfarim. Once Rav Lipman of Radomsk, the son-in-law of the Radomsker Rav, Rav Shlomo Hakon Rabinovich, traveled to Kutsk. When he met the Kutsker, the Rebbe asked him, Tell me something from your holy father-in-law. Rav Lipman related, Our sages exalt the great spiritual level of Aharon for remaining silent, but there is a level even higher than that, which is that of King David. David experienced all manner of trial and tribulation throughout his life, including the deaths of children. And yet, even at his lowest point, he proclaimed, Leman yizamercha chavod velo yidom, so that the glory will praise you and not be silent. You are my Lord, I will thank you always. The Kutzker was truly impressed by this idea. But let's ask, was David truly greater than Aharon? Let's look more closely at David's words. He did not say that in the midst of suffering, Leman azamercha velo edom, I will praise you and not be silent. He didn't say that. He rather said, the glory will praise you and not be silent. What did he mean by kavod, by glory? There are two parts to every person who is involved with public service, his private persona and his public persona. The private persona contains a person's emotional reactions, his ups and downs, his feelings of elation at success and misery at failure, and his feelings of heartbreak when tragedy strikes. But the public persona must at times cover up the personal emotions. If a person is a king or a leader, he needs to model behavior for the people he is leading. He may be in the midst of personal suffering, but he must put all of that aside if there is a message he needs to get out to the public. King David suffered tremendous heartbreak over his many losses and mistakes. He could have indulged those feelings of despair and depression, but that would have compromised his ability to lead. Instead, he put aside his personal suffering and called a press conference. The glory, the kavod, refers to King David's public persona and his need to present a message of confidence and thanksgiving to God to the rest of his people. King David's glory sang continuously to God even when he was crying on the inside. The same was true with Aharon, uh, with all uh, request of Mechila from the Radomsker. If we look carefully at the verses, Aharon was only initially silent because the shock of two holy children dying publicly in the service of the Mishkan was so shocking that there was nothing to say. The Nitziv points out that although Moshe tried to comfort Aharon, Aharon internally realized that this was in some way an atonement for the sin of the golden calf. Aharon actually did speak, albeit 16 verses later. Moshe had asked him, Why did you incinerate the chatat, the sin offering? Why didn't you and your surviving sons eat the meat of the sin offering as you were initially commanded? 
Aharon responded that as mourners it would not have been appropriate for them to eat the meat of a sacrifice. On a deeper level, the Nitziv comments that Aharon was explaining that he understood that his son's deaths represented a remnant of the golden calf atonement. God did not wish for us to eat the sacrifice, which would bring full atonement for B'nai Israel, because he has indicated through my son's deaths that there is still a remnant of sin that lingers. Aharon's press conference taught B'nai Israel that despite Hashem's great love for the Jewish people, they were still com- not completely in the clear from the golden calf. His initial silence was his personal persona reaction. His later public statement to Moshe was his public persona offering an educational message to the people. Similarly, when his children and wife initially were killed, when he first lived through that nightmare, we can only imagine Rabbi D's great expressions of agony. But once the cameras came on, he had an opportunity to make a Kiddush Hashem and call upon the world to recognize the difference between good and evil. His kavod, that is, the glory that he could show to God, needed to take over and his personal mourning had to at least temporarily cease. The Jewish world continues to mourn this great loss, just as we mourn the losses of Nadav and Avihu. When we cry over righteous people dying, this acts to atone and bring us closer to Hashem. The Holy Sfarim tell us that the Shabbat following Pesach contains the afterglow of the Pesach holiness, but also represents a return to everyday life. One of the reasons we read Parshat Shemini most years right after Pesach is because Pesach is like the seven days of Miluim, of the Mishkan's dedication described in this Parsha. But right afterwards, we started using the Mishkan in the regular fashion, the real grind of life, and brought the daily sacrifices. This is our job over the next several weeks, to resume our daily living, but to continually take gradual steps of ascent towards Kabbalat Torah and Shavuot. Both the celebrations and the tragedies of this past Pesach should linger with us. Let us continue to proudly display the Israeli flag as Rabbi D called upon us to do. Let us also join in his call upon the world to recognize the difference between good and evil, between Israel and its enemies, and to reject all forms of moral equivalence between terrorism and its victims. Let us pray that we in the world will come away with something positive from the D family's terrible tragedy. And may Hashem wipe the tears off all faces with the ultimate redemption. May we see it, dear friends. Bim Rabbi Amenu. Amen. Wishing you a Shabbat Shalom, a beautiful Shabbos.